43. He was led to a small chamber, richly furnished, from whose window he could see the bright rooms and torch-lit streets of the city of Ir, floating in the darkness over the glistening river. His guide bowed and left him, and he waited impatiently for some minutes. Eventually he sat down, studied the carving on the arms of his chair, tried to interest himself in the tapestry on the wall before him, and then stood up again. When the door finally opened, he turned to it with joy and eagerness, but it was Elam. His first thought was that she had come to lead him to Ruel, but she motioned him to the chair where he had just been sitting, stood gazing at him for a moment in silence, and then sat down herself in a chair facing him. I think you were expecting someone else, she said. Daruk said nothing, and she went on. Tell me, Daruk Kirorokris, do you know why you were invited to this dinner? Daruk had hoped that it was to bring him together with Rua, but he thought it best not to say so. It seemed to him that there was a dangerous brightness in Elan's eyes. I thought it was for your entertainment, he said. A soldier of Ashim must be a rare sight in the palace. You forget that Barinov is an old comrade of ours, and Yakurin is also well known to us as an adept of the green tree. But it's true that we have been entertained. Your skirmish with Tilbin was a delight to many of us, and your playing of the flute more than a delight. But entertainment is not what we were seeking. We see something in you, Arua, Kindro, and I, and everyone here has heard stories that are abroad in the city. So we wanted to see, and let others see, how you would conduct yourself in this world of the highest branches of Ashim, away from our barracks and battlefields. She paused, as if expecting Daruk to say something. He waited. What we saw, she said, was a man with little knowledge of our ways, but with the instincts of a counselor. We were quite impressed, even Tilbin, though you'd be wise not to turn your back on him. And Orokwes himself seems very pleased with you. That's probably more important than you realize. And then, seeing Daruk's expression, you didn't know that Orokwes was there? The old man at the end of the table, that was Orokwes. Daruk felt at sea. But no one, there was no sign, no said Elam, no bows, no ceremony. That was his wish, as well as ours, an informal dinner with friends linked by blood and policy. So I was on display, said Daruk, and to Orokris himself, and you were impressed by how the barbarian behaved? The bear danced well? Yes, said Elam, with the trace of a smile, the bear danced well. Yet you say this was not for your amusement, or not only for that. No, not for our amusement. We believe that if you are willing, you will be able to help us. Daruk thought for a moment. How would I be able to help you? In more ways than you can imagine. The city is full of tales about you. The tall Shanufu who cut down an agent. The lion of Orokris who killed the killers of Sarkil. But it was Barino who killed them. No doubt, but the tales grow. Some say that you are one of the knights of San, reborn and or reappeared. It's all nonsense, said Daruk. Yes, said Elan, but nonsense that gives hope to the people of Asham. And hope is what they need, for on all sides they see decline. Poverty in the place of wealth, danger where there was security, misery, weariness, anger, and desperation, looting and rioting, factions of the army fighting each other in the streets, conflict in the high branches of command, authority subverted, outspringers in the woods and hills, and even in the ruinous parts of the city, and everywhere the agents, picking about in the destruction like carrion crows, with their black cloaks and bright swords. But is it really so bad, said Daruk? Elan paused for a moment with a little smile. Perhaps not so bad, but you've seen something of the riots, and you know very well that there's danger in the streets. There was a time not so long ago when Kindro and I were glad to have your help. Everyone can see these things, and they hear rumors about the rest. So they dream of someone who stands apart from the wrangling and chaos, a great warrior who can face down the agents, someone like one of the knights of San. But I am not what the tales say, said Daruk. How can I help? By appearing to be what they think you are, and that requires no effort on your part. If it's no more than that, why tell me? It's a little more. We want you to be seen with us once in a while, to be seen with Orokris. To what end? To lend him a little of the myth that surrounds you, he is an old man, and the succession is unclear. There are those who would seize Ashim for themselves, and even some who would give it to the agents. But if Orokris has one beside him, who is bathed in light shining from the ancient world, Orokris will glow also with that light, and those who see him will see him as what he is, the living presence of the remembered greatness of the land of Ashim. You would use what is only appearance in me to reveal the truth of, in Orokris, 
But what was the need for this dinner? You already know what I am and how I appear. We know how you appear. And isn't that enough? We also need to know what you are. The man who stands by Oroquis, and perhaps at times speaks for him, must be one that we can trust. I would speak for him? Perhaps, when we would have Oroquis represented by his champion. I see. And I'm to be his champion? Yes, you're already Kir Oroquis, with your sword dedicated to the Lord of Asham. We would ask you to stand beside him, as ready to draw your sword in his name. Am I to fight for him? That has always been your duty, but only when you receive the command. Am I commanded to be his champion? In a case like this, it would be unwise for us to command what you are not willing to do. We know that you are loyal to Oroquis, but if you cannot be wholehearted in standing as the embodiment of his power, you will be seen to be false and will fail even as you try to obey. Whether I am willing or not, my duty at present is to the Third Army, under the command of Kair Val Oroquis, and Kair's duty is to Oroquis. If you are willing, all that can be made smooth. You might still serve in the Third Army, or perhaps in the Palace Guard, but you would serve at times also beside Oroquis. This is no small thing that you're asking, to stand as the champion of Oroquis. It is surely simple enough if you have the willingness to do it. I need time to think about it. Tell me, how am I to represent the power of Ashim when the whole world believes that I come from Shanwath? That's for us to worry about. But what you think is a weakness may in reality be a strength. How could it be a strength? They may see you as the power of Ashim returned from exile in the form of a barbarian. Oroquis has sent forth his power, and now it returns to him. I see, said Daruk. Well, I'll consider it. We had hoped that you would be eager to do it, but I suppose it's good that you're not impulsive. This is something more serious than a soldier's jape, said Daruk. I want to give it the consideration it deserves. All right, said Elam, but we need to know soon, and you must understand that you are to speak to no one about this. It would be very unfortunate, not least for yourself, if any rumor of this were to be heard, even among your friends in the Third Army. I understand, said Daruk. Then you will consider it. Keep in mind, Daruk Kiraroquis, that the Kira Amastu are, are already in your debt. But if you do this, you will earn the gratitude of Oroquis himself. And there are others who will also be well disposed to you. She stood up, caught his eyes once more with a glance full of cold fire, and left the room. Daruk sat for a few minutes, startled by the abruptness with which she left, and astounded by what was asked of him. Certainly it sounded simple enough to stand beside Oroquis as a symbol illuminating the Lord of Asham, but she had mentioned speaking for Oroquis and fighting as his champion. Clearly they had more in mind than what they were willing to tell him. To whom would they expect him to speak, and with whom would he fight? The same servant who had led him to the room appeared at the door, bowed, and indicated that he was to follow. They passed through a series of rooms and corridors and down some stairs, following another route than the one by which they had arrived. Then, as they turned into another corridor, Daruk saw walking ahead of them a large, shambling figure in the uniform of the palace guard. The huge shoulders and easy, loose-jointed gait were immediately familiar, and when the man turned to look back at them, Daruk saw that it was indeed Ingmed, his old comrade in arms. Ingmed seemed to recognize him without surprise, winked, and disappeared around a corner. Daruk was thinking about this while he armed himself in the porch, and as he strode out through the gate and over the bridge, he was still thinking about it. That Ingmed had found his way into the palace guard was perhaps so surpri not so pr surprising, though someone with the manner of a buffoon and the eye of an assassin would not have been Daruk's first choice for the position. But what was the significance of his wink? Was it only a plainful acknowledgement of old times? Or was there in fact something conspiratorial about it, as if he had already known that Daruk was in the palace and knew why he was there? And if he knew, what did that say about the secrecy that Elan had so insisted upon? The city was unusually quiet. A few flakes of snow were in the air, showing briefly like sparks in the light of the torches along the way. He walked slowly through the deserted streets, still thinking about Elan's proposal and the sudden appearance of Ingmed, and at last found himself once more in the gardens of Sana. Here he stood for a while, filled with the quiet desolation of the place, while the snow blew about him and the cold grew more intense. For a brief moment, he felt as if he were being watched, but when he looked about, there was no one to be seen. At last, he left the gardens, shivering a little, and climbed the stairs to his room. The candle that should have been burning in the corridor had gone out, so he had to grope his way in complete darkness. He unlocked his door after a moment's fumbling, and then, holding his shield and spear in his left hand, pushed it open. 
There was at once a sharp blow on his shield. He sprang into the room, his spear now in his right hand, leapt sideways, and as another arrow whispered at his ear, thrust to the limit of his reach at a dim shape behind his bed. The shape disappeared, and there was a scrabbling noise from under the bed. Daruk sprang onto the bed and tried to thrust down through the mattress, but the butt of his spear caught against the ceiling. He threw it aside, drew his sword, and waited. Everything was still for a moment. Then something went clattering over the floor, and as Daruk looked to see what it was, the shape emerged from the other side of the bed and slashed at his legs with a knife. Daruk stepped out of the way, and then, as it suddenly scuttled toward the, the door, bounded after it and cut it down. In the dim light, he could see it twist and shudder, and then become quiet. A pool of black spread out from the body. Daruk took out his flint and steel and kindled a fire in the little stove, a little candle from it. In the candle's light, the pool of black became red. His first thought was that his attacker was a child, but when he looked more closely, he saw that it was one of the people of the earth. The one stroke of his sword had cut deep into the base of his neck, almost severing the head. Daruk looked around and saw the bow that he had heard clattering across the floor. An arrow was sticking into the wall. The other was still standing in his shield, where he had dropped it. The window was open a little. That was how his attacker had come in. It was fortunate that the corridor was dark. If the candle had been burning there, Daruk would have been blind when he came into the darkness of the room. He sat down on the bed, feeling overwhelmed with grief and horror. It was as if the darkness had penetrated into his bones. He looked here and there in the room, but his gaze kept returning to the small body lying unchanged upon the floor. After a while, he began to shake. At last, he forced himself to get up and clean his sword, and then he pulled the arrow out of his shield, picked up his spear, and went out, locking the door behind him. As he groped his way down the stairs, the image of the body still floated before his eyes. It was a relief to step out into the cold air and the torchlight, to emerge from death into the bleakness of the world of life. He walked to the barracks of the Third Army, reported the attack, handed over the arrow which he had brought with him, and then bathed and went to bed. He fell asleep at once, but woke up again soon after, and spent the rest of the night tossing and turning, trying to comprehend how he could have been attacked by one of the people of the earth. At times he found himself reliving the struggle in the room, almost to the point of hallucination. In the morning he went to see Kair, who had already been told about the attack. The arrow was lying before him on the desk. Kair picked it up and looked at it thoughtfully. Smaller than usual, he said, like a child's, but the tip is poisoned. Poisoned, said Daruk. Yes, poisoned. Whoever sent the earth mouse to your room wanted to make sure of your death. You think he was hired to kill me? Hired or ordered? There are people in the city who own a few of these creatures and use them for work like this. It's a pity you killed it. We might have been able to persuade it to tell us who sent it. Who are these people? People of wealth and power. Earth mice are not cheap, and those who have them don't boast of it. These are a weapon that works best in darkness. But Tel Kir Umno is rumored to have some, and Zamis Kimbren, and Lahi Kir Iktina. Lahi Kir Iktina? So they say. But she is one who conceals herself, and such people often draw rumors as thick as flies. It's frightful that they should bend the people of the earth to do the work of an assassin. No more so than if they train dogs to that end. I understand that you were treated well by these creatures, that they showed you no less kindness than if they had been human. But you must remember that that was an aberration. They have always been at war with the human world, and they cheerfully kill us with their little bows, just as we kill them when we can. And you think it's all right for them to be used like this? I'd be ashamed to use them. They're a coward's weapon. But if you look at it through their eyes, they're housed and fed, perhaps better than they ever were in the wild, and they have the chance once in a while to kill human beings and that's what they were bred for, and their delight. But they're not free. What kind of outspringer's talk is that? No one is free. Even a masterless man is slave to his belly and his fear. These earth mice were brought, bought for a high price. Only a fool would not look after them. And if one of them is killed by the man it tried to kill, its fate is no worse than that of many of its kindred in the wild. But enough of this. I have news for you. Barino has been released. He's been released? The council has discharged him. He'll be returned to the Third Army no later than tomorrow. The memorial for Sakil could be in a month's time. And that's the end of it. Maybe. The Council has submitted its report, and Oroquis will no doubt accept it. But I think our enemies will not let it rest there. Yet if the Council has determined his innocence, what can they do? 
They can't question the judgment of the council, but they can claim that he was misled. With any chance of success? Probably not a great chance. The council won't be eager to think that it has been duped, and Oroquis knows well enough that our enemies are also his. But we must not underestimate the efficacy of wealth and corruption. That's why I have the approval of Oroquis to make a journey. I find that I have important affairs to attend to outside of Ear. There's no need, at this stage at least, to move the Third Army out of the city. But I'll take my hundred, including Barinoa, and yourself, of course. We're reinstated? Yes, or soon will be. We'll leave the day after tomorrow. There's no need for you to go back to your room. I've sent people to examine the body and dispose of it, and to look things over. They'll settle with the landlord and bring along anything you've left there. So you have two days to finish off whatever you're involved in. I trust there isn't much. No, there isn't much, said Daruk, and took his leave.